Well, folks, ATF press briefings are always pretty silly, but the recent chat between ATF Director Dettelbach, some guy called Chris, who is named as a firearms expert, and Margaret Brennan from Face the Nation really takes the cake. Let's see what went wrong. And I ask, would you trust these folks to make firearms policy? <laughs> Man. So not too long ago, Congressman Matt Rosendale created a letter with nine of his Republican colleagues. He sent it off to ATF Director Stephen Dettelbach, inquiring about the shutdown of the ATF eForm website, which occurred between February 27th, 2024 and March 1st. The website has proven to be a simple and effective method for Americans to access their right to own a firearm by significantly lowering wait times for ATF forms. Now, some of you might argue that we shouldn't have to fill out these forms from the ATF anyway, but at least the ATF had, in the past, put together this website to try to make their onerous operations a little bit easier for us. The forms include all of the important stuff that you need if you want to get anything like a short-barreled rifle or a suppressor, all these other things. It's a website where you can just download the forms so you can Fill them out online. You don't have to go into the gun store or someplace else where they have the forms. You can fill all of this stuff online for NFA equipment or anything like that. And it really does make it easier when you use that portal. Scan to, to fire. And you're doing it slow. What rate of speed are we talking about? If you, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Four rounds. Four to 500 uh, rounds per minute right. is I believe what they're claiming for this particular firearm. There is no reason you would use that for hunting. No, I, I do not believe you would use this for hunting. The Second Amendment is not about hunting. It was never about hunting. And I really want the mainstream media and the ATF to stop trying to connect the Second Amendment to hunting. It's not about hunting, it's about personal defense. Specifically, it's about being able to stand up to tyranny of an all-powerful government. Think about that for a minute. So there's two things going on here. One of them is you can shoulder a weapon. It makes it easier tactically to use, to aim, to fire, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's, a, it's a more accurate, more lethal weapon. At the same time, the smaller the weapon, the easier it is to hide. Mm -hmm. So Congress determined back in the 1930s that short-barreled rifles, which were both smaller than a certain length mm -hmm. and you know, were designed to be fired from the shoulders, that combination made it unusually dangerous, right? So, so here's two things. These are, look exactly alike, right? Mm -hmm. I defy, you know, one of them, everybody would agree is a short-barreled rifle because it's sold in one piece. The other one's the exact same thing, but it's sold in two pieces. So people are claiming, no, 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 that's a, that's a, a pistol brace. The two weapons are designed to be fired from the shoulder identically, uh, they, they, for all intents they and purposes. They look the same. Right? Mm -hmm. And so we're treating them the same. That's all that the short, that's all that that right rule says. We're treating these two things the same. So my question is this, what makes an SBR unusually dangerous? If firing a gun from the shoulder makes it more accurate, as the ATF director said, I would say that accurate shooting makes a firearm less dangerous. And I need to point something out here, SBRs, are fully and completely legal. The difference is that you have to apply through the NFA, you have to get a hold of the ATF to buy an SBR. You have to get permission. You need to pay more money in taxes, you need to register the gun, give your fingerprints, and get permission from the government to own a short-barreled rifle. If you do all that, then the gun is not unusually dangerous. Um, I mean, if it's a dangerous implement, it's a dangerous implement. They're just sort of charging more money. And that's just it. The government gets millions of dollars each year when people pay the extra fees to own an SBR. And, you know, gun accidents, actual unintended negligent discharges are going down because of good firearms training and, and honest law-abiding citizens are not hurting themselves or others with these SBRs. They're absolutely legal. You're seeing this on the rise with, what, gangs? Cartels. That's who? correct. Uh, so this is a 3D printed item. So these items, some of these, some of these items that we're looking at here today, these are printed with a 3D printer, $200 3D printer. Some of these can be printed out in as little as 20 minutes. This looks like it's a piece of a toy. 
It does. Like it, and again, it, it, it's inco incumbent upon ATF to, to teach and, and work with our law enforcement other agencies and, and, and teach them how to look and find these items. This item that the director is showing you here, this, so this is a privately made firearm. It has no serial numbers, no information on it. Oh. So that's what I didn't even know. That's also a ghost gun. Suddenly there is no mention of cracking down on gangs or drug cartels. All they want to do is restrict 3D printed parts and have other firearms restriction, and it starts their discussion of the dreaded ghost gun. This goes on for a while. At about 10.15, the ATF experts starts talking about ghost guns and the Glock switch. Dettelbach then lets his expert talk about the completion of an 80% frame on a Glock style pistol, saying how easy it is to make a scary ghost gun. Never mind that it was the ATF that created the rule about the 80% receivers not being actual firearms. But now that people are actually using their own rule, the ATF wants to change that rule. This isn't just a ghost gun. This is a ghost gun with one of these attached. This is a fully, to operate, this is a fully automatic pistol. So it will, you, you'll, you'll pull the trigger once and it will keep firing until there are no more bullets. And you can put, uh, again, uh, a normal magazine on there. You can put a larger magazine on there and, and you can shoot out that magazine, no matter how big it is, just with one pull of the trigger in, in, in fractions of a second. Then they just shifted right into the discussion of the Glock switch, pointing out that this switch will make the pistol fully automatic. Stop a minute, think about what they said earlier. Having a fully automatic firearm without the proper permits and tax stamps is already illegal. Yet criminals are still doing it. Does the ATF actually think that if criminals already ignore one gun law, or if they ignore the fact that murder and robbery are also illegal, do you really think that making a pistol with a Glock switch more illegal will suddenly make criminals comply with the law? Now this is the part where the interview gets really funny. The ATF firearms expert tries unsuccessfully for more than a minute to disassemble and reassemble a Glock style pistol. He finally has to hand the gun he's trying to put back together to someone off camera for help. Now, let's see if I can take my own Glock style pistol apart and put it together faster than the expert from the ATF. And I'll talk my way through it as I do this too, kind of like walking and chewing gum at the same time. We'll see if I can get this done. Ready? And go. First thing we're going to do is make sure that we remove the source of ammunition from the firearm keeping the firearm pointed in a safe direction. Make sure the live round is out. Visually and physically inspect the chamber. I'm doing all the safety stuff he should have known to do. Make sure that the gun is empty. Now, pull the trigger on the Glock to disassemble. Pull the disassemble parts down. Oh, my gun is apart. Oh, quick, let's put it back together. I'm getting nervous on camera in front of the millions and millions of viewers. And I'm having the same trouble that our firearms expert had, getting it back together. So maybe we'll give him a little bit of a pass, but no, I still got plenty of time. There we go. Perform a function check. My gun is now safely back together and down on the table. Way less time than the ATF expert took. And yeah, I would even messed up a little bit in there when I was putting it back together. Maybe it's time to clean that everyday carry gun and put it back together and, and lubricate it just perfectly. So after that, they get right back to talking about the guns of the cartels. And they're looking at one particularly gaudy gold pistol but there is no mention of the fact that an open border allows the cartels to operate with impunity and certainly there's no mention of the atf's fast and furious program that actually sent guns across the border and ended up with the death of a federal agent the guy was killed by one of those guns the atf sent across the border so if you wish to stop the flow of guns, either way across the border, they're blaming American gun shops for sending guns to Mexico, and we know that's not true. Maybe we need to work on better border security. In addition to, like you see this 50 cal weapon here, which is a favorite of, of the cartels, and this, this, these are considered uh, rifles, and they can be acquired by 18-year-old uh, uh, individuals. Then they moved on to one of the things that I found just absolutely amazing. This 
discussion that an 18-year-old could buy a 50 caliber rifle. We're talking about a $12,000 rifle here first and foremost, but someone, anyone, show me the huge number of 18 to 20 year olds using 50 caliber sniper rifles to commit crimes. In fact, I wish someone would show me the number of crimes committed with these rifles at all. I really don't think criminals are toting 38 pound rifles to crime scenes. Man, <laughs> I'd love to just once get an invitation to one of these dog and pony shows and ask real questions of the director of the ATF. Better yet, I'd love to have the folks from Face the Nation attend a USCCA training class and see what real law-abiding gun owners do with their firearms. But even then, our left-leaning media would certainly edit that piece to portray gun owners in the worst possible light. People used to respect the media. It was called the fourth estate because it added to the checks and balances built into our government. Now, it seems to be nothing more than a mouthpiece for anti-gun propaganda, and that's pretty sad. Folks, the ATF decided to roll this out in an election year just to make people start talking about how bad guns are. Guns are not bad. The people who use guns sometimes do bad things, some of those people, but considering the hundreds of millions of guns in this country, the number of people who are doing bad things with guns is relatively small, and we're not going to stop those people from doing bad things by putting more restrictions on law-abiding gun owners. You know that, and I know that, and everybody else should know that.